All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joined us. We have a great crowd this morning from all over the world, so thank you very much for that. Um, welcome, and thank you for joining us for this event to launch and celebrate the publication of the MPA Guide. My name is Susan Rufo, and I am a Senior Advisor for Ocean and Climate at the United Nations Foundation. And almost a year and a half ago, the United Nations Foundation sponsored a very similar event to this to introduce the ideas behind the MPA Guide to stakeholders, just like all of the people who are um, attending today. And uh, hopefully some of you joined us then. And today we are very pleased to be part of the launch of the guide uh, right after its publication in Science yesterday. And given the importance of protected areas to the SDGs, and particularly in current discussions at the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, we are very, um, very pleased with bringing this timely event and to introduce the MPA guide as a tool that will help all stakeholders work together on a path forward with a common understanding and a clear science-based framework in which we can discuss MPAs. So we've got a very full agenda today, um, which we'll use to talk about the MPA guide, to provide some examples for how the MPA guide can work. And then we've um, hopefully left a lot of time for questions from all of you. So without fur further ceremony, I would like to get started. And I would like to invite our first speaker to help us set the stage for today's discussion. And so to start us off, we are very fortunate to have with us today, Basil Van Avre. Mr. Van Avra is co-chair of the Convention on Biological Diversity's open-ended working group for a post-2020 global, global biodiversity framework. And he has over 27 years of experience working in Canada's Environment Department, where his roles have included Director General of Biodiversity and Partnerships and Director of Population Conservation and Management at the Canadian Wildlife Service. And in light of the ongoing discussions about post-2020 biodiversity framework at the CBD, we really welcome this opportunity to hear from him directly for how about how tools like this guide can be helpful. So Mr. Van Avra, you have the floor. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for having uh, having me. And uh, good day, good uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I'm delighted to be able to contribute to these efforts, and and for for several reasons. As you know, uh, we've started some uh, in-depth discussion of the global biodiversity framework. And this morning, as I was preparing for, for this session, I went back to the report from the, from the two weeks of discussion and went specifically to target number one, two, and three about uh, management of space, restoration, and conservation and protection. I want to highlight a few things. And I want to, I want to highlight that uh, a lot of the discussion I heard through the two weeks was going well beyond what is the number we're going to be putting in front of the target, which, which uh, we all know there is lots of uh, support for certain numbers. But what I've seen is a lot of comments about effectiveness of uh, the protection and conservation and, and how we don't have very solid data on that side. Um, if you look at the targets, it's one thing to look at it on its own, but uh, when Francis and I uh, started drafting draft one, we had in, on our screen two documents. On one side, the, word, the, the text of the targets. Um, on the other side, we had the, the performance indicators. And, and there is a number of index about the effectiveness of uh, uh, protected and conserved area. However, I still think there is, there is room for, for growing, room for improvement, because what we want in the end is a result. We want those, um, those protected and conserved area to deliver the benefit and the result they were intended intend to, to, to provide. In themselves, uh, they are wonderful initiatives, but their only initiative, what we're looking for, is, is the outcome and the result. So. If uh, your initiative and your work can help to make better uh, protected and conserved area and to see it, situate those protected and conserved area within the context of a broader managed landscape. And that's take me to the last point I wanted to raise with you, which is target one around management of seascape and landscape and, and how we not only care about the uh, 17, the 10%, the 30% of the 50%, but we actually do care about 100%. So we know that certain part of the landscape will be used for productive purposes. 
uh, in the marine context. It could be it could be fishery. It could be situating uh, um, a wind power, and and we need to ensure that those initiatives are situated in the right place. It is not about stopping. It's about making informed decision throughout the landscape, and that's where information about effectiveness of the measures is very important. So. Um, I'm getting to the end of that very short three minutes you gave me. Thank you very much. I am looking forward to hear the rest of the concept, the conversation here and the panelists, and I'll remain available should there be uh, some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that intervention. I think that was a perfect way to set the scene for this discussion on the MPA guide. And I think the point about it's not just about the numbers, but it's really about effectiveness and what we're doing in all of these places um, is really critical as we go through this. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Ambassador Valdemar Kutz. Um, Ambassador Kutz is Director of, of Environment and Oceans at the Chilean Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and a very well-known international ocean advocate. Um, his impact can be seen in the legacy of Chile's Our Ocean Conference, as well as Chile's establishment of several world-class MPAs, and Chile's current championing of um, a high seas MPA. So Ambassador Kutz, thank you so much for joining us, and you have the floor. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a real privilege. Uh, well, the launch of this MPA guy comes at the time when there is concluding scientific evidence uh, pointing out that the most practical and cost-efficient way or strategy for ocean protection is the creation of MPAs. Now, my country walks the talk. We have created 41 MPAs, accounting for about 43% of our vast economic exclusive zone, which is the 10th largest in the world. Moreover, in our view, uh, the clear interconnection of three UN processes, such as climate change, biodiversity, 30% by 2030, and the high seas, BBNJ, shows us that ocean protection emerges as the key to solve the most crucial challenge humanity is facing today, namely climate change. Now, it is in this context that the MPA guide will establish a better MPA system based on shared standards. The idea is to uniformly map, track, and evaluate marine protection worldwide while improving cooperation between countries. The guide comes about from an inclusive and extensive collaboration with all stakeholders. It provides clarity, and delivers a new evidence-based picture of where we stand on ocean protection. This is a tool providing a consistent framework and practical guidance for planning, implementation, mon and monitoring of uh, MPAs. From another perspective, uh, the creation of future MPAs must bear in mind the following. First, that 70% of the earth is ocean. Secondly, that 27% of that percentage are territorial waters. And thirdly, that 43% of the 70% uh, are international waters. So this is a conclusive argument that to protect at least 30% of the global ocean by 2030 within the framework of the CBD, uh, we must take first steps to create MPAs in the high seas as envisaged, for example, by the future high seas agreement with a view to protect marine uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions, including through a network of MPAs. It is against this background that during the leaders summit uh, on climate convened by President Biden last April, Chilean President Sebastián Piñera underlined the need to be more ambitious and begin the second phase uh, of global efforts on this matter in the high seas. This is why we are leading uh, the way to create through a process the a high seas MPA in the southeastern Pacific, destined to protect the Nazca and Salas y Gomez ridges. Uh, this zone is one of the 10 uh, ecologically or biologically significant areas 
under the CBD. Uh, we wish to, uh, maybe Claire, if you could show the, the slide, just to have a glimpse of, uh, of uh, what we are uh, uh, doing. We wish to link up existing protections, Chilean protections, by connecting the fully protected Nazca Venturas MPA to the east and the highly and fully protected areas of Rapa Nui and Motu Motirohiva to the west. Why do we do this? It is simply due to the overwhelming sense of urgency, which once again has been uh, confirmed by the sixth assessment report of the IPCC matters are getting worse. And on the other hand, we do not only wish to lead the example, but also to be at the forefront of ocean sustainability. Our gratitude goes to those uh, NGOs, institutions, foundations that have expressed their support on this uh, project. In concluding, the launch of the MPA guide is a clear contribution in building ocean science capacity, innovation, and knowledge transfer to create a common understanding on MPAs and to better conserve and enhance ocean ecosystems, its functions, and services. The guide will collaborate on achieving transformational ocean science in line with SDG 14 for further action that will allow us to move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want. Finally, we welcome this new tool as an effort consistent with and supportive of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, both mandated by the UN General Assembly for the period 2021-2030. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kutz, for that really inspiring example of what one country can do to protect the ocean and the people who depend on it. And also the incredibly important point that one country can't do it alone. And so having something like the MPA guide where we have a common language that we can really uh, work together is gonna be critical for moving forward. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I think this is also an excellent segue into a more detailed discussion of what the MPA guide is, how it was developed, how it was envisioned to be a tool for supporting exactly this kind of work and for new efforts around marine conservation. And so for this discussion, I would like to in, uh, invite a panel of some of the co-authors of the guide. Um, and then we'll begin with a few questions and I'll open the floor for questions from um, everyone in the audience. So please be ready with your questions and uh, you can put those in the Q&A box. And so it is my pleasure now to introduce our panel. Um, I will start with Dr. Kirsten Grorud Colbert. Uh, Kristen is an ocean scientist who studies marine ecology and marine protected area outcomes around the globe. And she is an associate professor at Oregon State University and lead author of the MPA guide. Our second panelist is Dr. Dan Lafoley. He is principal advisor, marine science and conservation for the global marine and polar program at the IUCN. And he has the global honorary role of Marine Vice Chair for the World Commission on Protected Areas. And he is also a co-author of the NPA Guide. We next have Dr. Anna Spaulding. Dr. Anna Spaulding is an Associate Professor of Marine and Coastal Policy at Oregon State University and a Research Associate at the Smithsonian Tropical Institute and Coiba Research Station in Panama. Uh, she is also a co-author of the NPA Guide. And our final speaker is Estradivari. Um, who has more than 15 years of experience as a conservation research manager at WWF Indonesia, um, a program assistant for small islands and indigenous knowledge at UNESCO and science program manager and vice director at the Indonesian Coral Reef Foundation. And she is currently an early stage researcher at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Research, Tropical Marine Research. So thank you all for joining us um, and I'm excited to get to it. So Kirsten, I'd like to start with you. As lead author on the MPA guide, can you start by just talking us through it, uh, what it is, what it aims to achieve and how it does that? Great, thanks Susan so much. And thanks to the UN Foundation for hosting, thanks to all the esteemed speakers today. Um, at its core, the MPA guide is a transparency tool. 
early on in our listening and learning sessions, you know, it became clear that there was a lot of confusion about MPAs and what they could achieve. Now, first of all, there are many different types of area-based management tools. MPAs are one type. IUCN defines them as having biodiversity conservation as their primary goal. And we realized that all MPAs were being lumped together when we talked about them. Even though we know there are different types of MPAs with different activities happening inside them. Um, and we also would expect that there would be different outcomes because of that. So we mined information from decades of scientific studies to resolve this confusion. So why is it important to resolve this confusion? Well, I recently realized that I need reading glasses and um, all those words that were blurring together on the page once I put on my glasses, you know, I was able to see the details, the words and get the big picture. And so the MPA guide provides that kind of clarity. It gives us a shared language to talk about MPAs. It's a consistent framework that we can use. We can use it to plan, implement and monitor MPAs. And um, it also allows us to look at MPA effectiveness, you know, beyond just a single numerical target, just like co-chair Venov was mentioning in his remarks this morning. So what does it aim for? Um, the MPA guide aims for a new evidence-based picture of where we stand on ocean protection. We can use it to understand what we still need to safeguard the ocean. We can use it to understand where we need to direct additional support, for example. How does the guide do this? Well, the MPA guide does this by categorizing MPAs into different types based on four key elements. And these are their stage of establishment, their level of protection, the enabling conditions for inclusive and effective MPA practices. So for example, decision-making that is evidence-based and equitable. And the MPA guide matches these three to the outcomes an MPA can expect to deliver for ocean biodiversity, but also for the people who depend on it. So this is ecological outcomes, more fish, bigger fish, intact habitats, but also outcomes for human well-being. Uh, for example, preserving culturally important species or habitats or perspectives. Um, so if I can share my screen, I'll show an example of the way that the MPA guide um, steps through and categorizes these. Okay, so these are the levels of protection. There are four, and they range from minimally protected to fully protected. Now in the paper, uh, we share a decision tree. This is based on the seven different types of activities that may or may not be happening in MPAs. And by going through and answering a question about whether or not it's happening, and then also what the impact is or the level, the intensity of it, you can follow the decision tree down here and arrive at an answer about what level of protection your MPA is, fully, highly, lightly, or minimally. We also have a website that we're happy to share now that the paper is live as well. And the website gives a click through format where you look at the different questions about the different types of activities and answer yes or no, or the level of uh, intensity or frequency. And then you uh, end up with a level of protection for your MPA. For any given MPA, you can take that approach. So um, that's what we have to offer in terms of the tools of the MPA guide. And our goal is for this to provide the kind of understanding that we need to match, to match the outcomes we want, um, and also with the types of MPAs that we want to implement and need to implement to reach those outcomes. So, it's really important to state that the MPA guide is not a campaign, it doesn't advocate for a particular type of MPA, no value judgment made about MPAs or the different types. This is one tool um, with a number of different types in the toolbox. This is a review of the science. It integrates those decades of published research um, and results from MPA studies. So we currently have trials underway in Canada in Indonesia in South Africa, in Portugal, in France, in the US. Um, and in these places, MPA experts are using the MPA guide to analyze and categorize existing MPAs so that communities and governments can make informed decisions. So that's a long answer. The MPA guide will be continually tested and adjusted. We're learning from the country-based trials. We want to continue having discussion about this among groups 
So we welcome any feedback and insights and I really look forward to the conversation today. Thanks, Sue. Great, thanks so much for that overview. And I wanna stick with you for just a second because I know developing the guide was quite a process and it involved a lot of collaborators uh, in this effort. So could you share with us briefly the experience of working with such a large cohort of authors and reviewers and what that really added to the guide? Oh, great, thank you, yes. So this is what a research-led collaboration looks like. The guide is the work of many people, scientists, managers, governance experts, community members, stakeholders. Many of you on this call have heard about the MPA guide and that's because you were directly involved in this iterative process. Our focus was on a system that would be both useful so it would give us the information that we need, but also usable so that it would be easy to use in the real world. And so uh, if I may, I wanna say thank you to the 41 other co-authors. I could share my screen again. I have a list of everyone. Um, Let's see, uh, here are all the 42 co-authors and also with deep thanks to the many hundreds of reviewers who gave feedback and insights in the early days and later stages of the guide. Uh, I can't name them all, but <clears throat> many of you are on this call, thank you. Because so many different people were involved, you know, the guide can be useful in many different contexts. If you're a manager, for example, wanting to plan a new MPA or um, look at your, can, uh, your existing management plan and update it or adapt it, the guide can be useful to you. If you're a country setting the targets, um, the guide can be useful to you. So um, we encourage you to look at the science paper, to look at the website and reach out if you have any questions and we look forward to continuing the dialogue in this way. Great. Um, well, congratulations to you and all of those authors. Uh, it's really exciting to see this, this out. Um, and I think that's a great uh, opportunity to turn to you, Dan. Um, you know, as Marine Vice Chair for the World Commission on Protected Areas, um, can you talk a little bit about how the MPA guide relates to IUCN's framework for protected areas and how it can really help us uh, to establish effective MPAs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks for that question. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's real, a real pleasure to be with you all today. So in terms of that, that question, um, this is a really important development because, I mean, it will really add to, to, I think, three areas which are about transparency, accountability and equity. And let me explain what I mean. You know, as we all know, and, and we're just having the World Conservation Congress um, in Marseille, and you know, the world is focused on this, this dual problem of, of climate change and biodiversity loss and trying to get out this, this incredibly deep and deepening hole that humanity has put itself in. And there's a real interest in uh, ocean protection as part of a whole ocean approach, as we've been reminded right at the start that we need to be taking to try and tackle these issues. Of course, when you then go and say, how much of the ocean have we protected? and you go to the World Conservation Monitoring Center site, the, the official site, and this is no criticism of them because this is what they're currently asked to do, you get a map of marine protected areas of loads of blue dots across the world. And that's all you get. And it says 7.65% uh, is protected. But if you then ask the question, how much is protected? That's a different question. And you then have to go to other sites like the MPA Atlas site. And then you find out that in actual fact, it's probably 2.7%. And so you, if it, you know, in, in 2021, we have to scrabble around a bit to try and see what we're all achieving with vast quantities of private and public money around the world. And there's, there's a lack of transparency and accountability. And, and of course, right now, under the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, countries are looking to, to scale up ocean protection as part of this, this overall approach. And, and so we really need to fix this and we re really need to work out um, what we are doing and what we are achieving. And of course, as Kirsten's just said, the MPA guide does this by providing some new analysis, a consistent framework and practical guidance to look at a different angle. And, and what, we're, what we're launching here really complements what IUCN has been doing over the past decades. So obviously we have a well-established definition of marine protected area. 
we we've looked at it from the management objective side, the the uh, the the IUCN protected area management categories. We've looked at it from the governance side, the range of governance types you might have, and we've looked at it or are looking at it as well from the effective management side, the the green list uh, process that we have. Um, they're all great. They all serve really important purposes. But when you actually come back to how much have we protected, um, where are we with marine protected areas in terms of the stage of establishment, the levels of protection, it, it's, it's a blind spot. In the same way as Descripta said that the natural environment is a blind spot to economics, we have this blind spot in our ability to do things. And so the MPA guide brings some practical advice some analysis into this space and says, what if, look, this is what you can do. And I think that this can be really transformative, connected also to the enabling conditions and outcomes. For me, if we adopted this at the regional broad, broad international level, it's akin to the difference between one of those very first grainy sepia Kodak photos where you don't get a lot of clarity and a modern digital high resolution photo that contains so much information. It's the difference between seeing, if you like, in black and white and seeing in color. And I think there is a time for these things and the time for this is now because we've got a lot of information as the study has drawn on to actually demonstrate and provide the evidence behind this, the enabling conditions. And, and therefore, from, from my position, I think this is a really welcome development and ultimately, what I hope we can see is people using this so that we, we can see with clarity what is actually protected, where more effort is needed, and what levels of, of establishment people are, are going through or struggling with. And we know this is, is also about equity. So if we did that, it wouldn't be about the, the biggest agency with the most money saying, look what we've achieved. You'd be able to see what all the small marine protected areas had achieved as well. And I think from the donor perspective, what it also does, because there's an incredible interest in outcomes, is actually helps focus some of that to see where we are delivering and where we need to deliver more. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. I think that's incredibly helpful to put it in the context of what, what exists and what we've been working on now. And I love the picture analogy. Um, and I'd like to talk to you, because I think uh, you bring a really unique perspective to this. You are also a co-author on the guide. You're bringing your social and policy perspective um, to the work that, that is being done here. Now, the MPA guide takes into account social dimensions such as human well-being and gender equity. Um, what does this mean for equity considerations in the context of MPA design and implementation? Well, I think it's fundamentally important, and that's why I raised it as one of the uh... The, 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 the sort of key issues as one of the three achievement areas that it can bring. Um, it's fundamentally important uh, that we actually have a more equitable way in, in terms of delivering these things and a more transparent way as well, so that we can actually uh, celebrate the achievements of different parts of society in actually delivering the aims that we have and perhaps um, um, evolve our approaches accordingly. Great, thank you. And I'd like to um, I'd like to bring in Anna on that question as well, just because I know that she brings a, a perspective, a social policy perspective on that as well. Thanks, Thanks Susan. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here with uh, this great panelist, as well as um, all the co-authors that are attending as well. Um, so. I, I, yes, I'm a marine social scientist, and as one of the co-leads on the human dimensions element of the guide, um, I specifically focused on the social outcomes and the enabling conditions uh, piece of, of this effort. So as others have already shared, the guide is an excellent tool, and it provides us a consistent and sort of transparent framework um, for planning, implementing, and monitoring NPAs. Um, so as, again, it's this shared language for assessing the quality and not just the quantity. Um, so in addition to the what, which is really that, you know, when we think about the MPA itself, um, the guide uh, also provides insights into the who. So this is effectively bringing people back into conservation. Um, and the guide does this in two specific ways. Um, first, as part of the guide, um, 
we consider people to be essential to the assessment of effectiveness. So in other ways, uh, not only are we measuring or assessing ecological outcomes, but also really focusing on those social outcomes. So that is one of the ways in which we can bring in those considerations of people, um, well-being and equity. Um, so specifically in the guide, we talk about the social outcomes as, um, as a multidimensional uh, human well-being, which considers things such as social, economic, cultural, governance, uh, health, all the different domains of what we care about in terms of people and those folks who directly depend on the resource. Um, and along with those assessments of those social outcomes and how they relate to the different uh, components of the guide, so level of establishment and stage um, and, and stage of establishment and level of protection. We also consider people as essential to the process of establishment, implementation, and monitoring. So we do this, or it, through the guide, we did this through the synthesis of the enabling conditions for effective MPAs. Um, and so I'll give you an example. As a parent, I care deeply about uh, the well-being and, and success of my kids and to the youth in general. So um, I think about what conditions or basic requirements need to be in place, right? We think about education, we think about nutrition, health, a clean environment, gender equality. These are sort of the building blocks um, for a healthy childhood. Um, and of course, we can add layers to these different building blocks, depending on the child and the societal context in which they find themselves. So for MPAs, those enabling conditions are those building blocks. Um, and so examples of those building blocks include uh, developing partnerships with indigenous communities and other rights and stakeholders involved uh, in the process or who are affected somehow by MPAs and also who affect depending on these activities. Um, another example would be inclusive, equitable and evidence-based decision-making around clear uh, and transparent goals for our MPAs. Um, we also think about things like financial commitment, political commitment, uh, and monitoring so that we can inform management. And clearly uh, having collaborative, transparent, um, and accountable communication across all different partners. So really when we think about it, it's including both measurements of the outcomes as well as the process itself. Um, so in the context of a much needed growing recognition for equity in ocean governance broadly, uh, those enabling conditions that consider both who and how MPAs are established are really critical. And the guide is an opportunity for all of us involved in MPA and ocean governance to deeply think and to think about and assess the conditions that are in place uh, to achieve uh, the ocean that we want. Um, importantly, as Kirsten already mentioned, the guide is going to be continuously tested and adjusted. Um, and so further assessment of those social outcomes and enabling conditions uh, in the particular national or regional con context is, is a key part of these next steps. Thank you. That's great, thank you. And I, there couldn't be a more timely topic. So thank you. Um, I have one more question for the panel for Estra, uh, who I think can bring all of this together as someone who's really working in the water with the guide. Um, so Estra, can you walk us through how the guide has been useful and how it's a practical tool for you and for the ocean um, and uh, we would just love to hear your perspective on all of that. So thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Susan, uh, UN Foundation, also Kirsten for the uh, opportunity. Um, I, I'd like to walk to how we um, test the MPA guide in Indonesia. I'm from Indonesia, but currently I'm based in uh, Bremen, working for the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research. So as you may know, Located in the center of Coral Triangle, a vast marine area with the richest and most diverse species on the planet, Indonesia has become the global priority for marine conservation. MPA has been the primary conservation tool implemented by the government to protect coastal ecosystem and have rapidly expanded in coverage in recent decades. MPAs in Indonesia are established in coastal area where local communities have high natural resource dependency and therefore, Indonesia adopts modified form of the IUCN MPA definition that include equitable access to resources and recognize other local needs. Conservationists, therefore, often advocate for the important biodiversity gain that can be made from lightly protected areas that seek 
that seek to optimize biodiversity conservation and human well being while allowing extractive use. There are um, there are tricky challenging, trick challenges when tracking Indonesian MPA progress toward target at the national and international level. First, MPAs in Indonesia, tar the target of Indonesian MPAs are multidimensional. They often include elements around extent, management effectiveness, and outcomes. Second, individual MPAs are also highly diverse, including a wide range of approaches from complete access closure of marine areas to partial protection approaches that allow substantial resource use. And last, the government uses two different management tracker tools with a different measurement system to track individual MPA establishment, progress, and management effectiveness. So in 2020, so more than a year ago, actually in early 2020, by sourcing data from 148 MPAs, the government of Indonesia and some NGOs, including me, we conducted an assessment of Indonesia's national MPA estate using the MPA guide stage of establishment and level of protection criteria. Using the MPA guide to understand the stages and levels of Indonesia's FPAs, this analysis identifies the investments Indonesia has made in MPAs using a new global framework and demonstrate the ongoing process to establish and actively manage these sites. The MPA guide does not intend to change or replace individual tools developed and used by national governments, but aims to help communicate progress in the global context. So how, do, how, how did we do it? We align individual, individual questions or parameter from each tracker tool against the core criteria of stage of establishment and level of protection from the MPA guide. In some cases, the alignment is really straightforward because the measurement parameters are directly related to the MPA guide criteria. For example, uh, in, in MPA guide, for an MPA to be implemented, the criteria include that management body or team exists. We match this criterion with the question in our tracker tool that asks, are there conservation area management personnel in place? So it's, it's kind of similar, so we can just directly match them. Uh, but identifying level of protection is much more challenging as all MPAs in Indonesia are required to use donation to balance different stakeholder needs. This means that all MPAs in Indonesia have differing applied rules and regulation by zone, which lead to varying level of protection for different zones within the individual MPAs. Um, from this exercise, we identified 42% of MPAs as proposed and only 9% of MPAs in Indonesia as actively managed. Regarding the level of protection, we found that the majority of Indonesia's MPA were lightly uh, or minimally protected. Well, uh, our analysis shows it's possible to align existing nationally collected tools and database with the MPA guide to conducting rapid assessment of the national uh, MPA networks. The MPA guide provides a common language and framework for the governments and other stakeholders intending to track MPAs based on the different protection level they provide. They facilitate monitoring and progress and enable discussion about realistic outcomes based on permitted and prohibited activities. What we like from the MPA guide is that it makes no judgment on desired or appropriate conservation intervention which must be adapt adapted to ensure appropriateness to local context and national priorities. Instead, it is a tool for evaluating, celebrating, and supporting steady improvement in MPAs and MPA networks, especially in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it, is, it is great to get a real world example for how over this is coming together. Um, I know there are a lot of other people out there who have questions for the panel, so I'd like to open it up. And I just wanna say it has been really amazing to see the global interest in this in the chat and everyone's enthusiasm. So thank you all for joining us. Some of you I know from pretty much the middle of the night. So um, thank you for all of that. Um, please type your question in the Q&A box. We've also got several of our co-authors online with us. So some of those will be being answered in writing in the Q&A box, uh, and then we'll take some of them live with the panel here. 
Um, so we've actually gotten a lot of questions about the reporting side of this work. Um, and essentially the question is, for those who collate data on MPAs around the world and tally area and MPAs worldwide, how does the MPA guide apply? And so for this, I actually would like to invite one of our other co-authors on the MPA guide um, who is with us in virtually uh, to join the panel and reply to that. Um, and that is Dr. Naomi Kingston. Uh, Dr. Kingston is the head of operations at the United Nations Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center. So Dr. Kingston, I will pass that question to you. All right, great, thanks, Susan. Um, it's a good question. And, and so the, the MPA guide has just been published, is published today. Um, so as Basile says, it's not yet formally part of the international reporting process, but there is a very strong need for us to have a lot more good information on effectiveness. And this is really, really where the MPA guide comes into play. So, I mean, I guess this is for us at UNEP WCMC, this is it's, it's not the end, the publication isn't the end, it's the start, because now we actually have to see how this becomes implemented, how we train people to use it. Kirsten showed a really nice example of, of a website. So one of the beautiful advantages of this is it's very straightforward and for anybody who has access to the right information to do the analysis. So anybody can go through an MPA and test and see, does it actually meet the, what level of protection it meets, what state, um, state of establishment it meets. Um, we're looking really at, at how we can use this to improve our information on effectiveness. So as Dan mentioned, lots of, all of the countries in the world report to us where their marine protected areas are, but we don't yet have good information on how effective they are. And there's multiple ways of measuring that, but the MPA guide, um, adds a nice new layer to that because it has also got this information on, on what you can expect in terms of your conservation outcomes. So there's a great opportunity here for countries to look at their suite of MPAs, run them through the MPA guide and then level up. So what changes can be made in order to make these sites more effective? Um, we will be looking at how this information can be collected. At the moment, the Atlas of Marine Protection, several of whom are, are on the call here, have been doing this analysis, taking information that they can gather together on sites to see where they fit on the matrix of protection and, and establishment. And we would hope that as it gets rolled out, we've heard a great example there of, of its national use in Indonesia. We know there are a lot of other countries who are also looking at it. We really hope we'll be able to build much stronger picture of not just where the MPAs are, but what they're actually achieving. Um, so yeah, the, the reporting isn't figured out. We haven't got that far yet, but we are definitely keen to make sure that it is part of that global reporting system, because it is going to be the thing that lets us know whether MPAs are achieving their conservation goals. Thanks. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, it's helpful and I, I think it's really important that we put all of this in context because there is so much work going on, So thank you. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about equity, which I think is fantastic. So Anna, I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about the role of equity in the guide uh, and you know what you've been thinking about. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, that's a really, it's a really important question. When we think about equity, as I said earlier, right, we can think about it in two perspectives, one in terms of the outcomes, and the second part in terms of the process itself. Um, I think we all know uh, through <laughs> over the past year, if we, and well, yeah, over the, definitely over the past year and a half, we need to take into account the different experiences, places, uh, learning knowledge that different people bring to the table. Otherwise, we're not all going to be there. And not only we're we not gonna all be there, but we're also going to miss out on opportunities to really understand the broad context, the broad um, context of, of conservation in particular, and you know, thinking about MPAs. Um, so how we intentionally do things in order to make sure people can be at at the table is going to make a huge difference in terms of being able to achieve the goals that we want. Because if there are only three of us at the table, we're going to achieve the goals that those three of us want, not the goals of the people who are directly affected. So that's why when we think about equity, it's not just about the conservation of the species, but it's about people that are going to support um, the, the are going to support the management, are going to support the goals, are going to be invested in the outcomes um, that we want for, for a particular place. So in terms of 
the process, I think that's where we think about equity. And in terms of the outcomes, again, it's a, if, we, if we don't specifically consider how an MPA is affecting all the people, communities, uh, stakeholders, rights holders that are affected by the establishment of a protected area, um, we're only measuring a part of the story. And so it's really important to be able to tell the bigger story of how it impacts folks. And that way we can also then bring them back into the process. Great, thank you for that. And I know there's a lot of interest in that topic. Um, Kirsten, I wanna to turn to you for the next question. We have a question around outcomes outside of the MPAs. Um, so how does the MPA consider what happens in the surrounding area, for example, when fishing effort is displaced? Great, yeah, thanks for that. That great question, that kind of gets at the data side of what was compiled in the MPA guide. So when we say we're using studies from peer reviewed literature, you know, we're, we're talking about evaluations that scientists did about MPAs and that really encompasses the setup. How, how do they collect the data, where and when and how? And so, you know, part of the vetting in uh, going through and looking at those studies is making sure that when an MPA is evaluated, it's being compared to the areas outside as well. So it's not just you go to an area and do surveys and see what's there underwater and then just report that. You have to put it in context. So first of all, I would say that, you know, all this scientific data looks at inside and outside because you know, that's just a, a robust approach to understanding what MPAs do. Um, I, I would maybe add, add something to that as well. You know, the question about how MPAs and fisheries you know, work together or also you know, each occupy space in the ocean realm is a really important one. And both are needed. <laughs> fisheries are needed. Biodiversity conservation is needed really to support each other. And so the guide lets us peel back the layers a little bit more. So it's not just all MPAs and fisheries effects. Um, it's different types of MPAs and how they're interacting with fisheries. And really, again, to bring this clarity, we really have no idea. Everything is lumped together and we need a better understanding so that we can manage both better. Great, thank you. And I think that uh, is related to the next question. So maybe for Dan, but I'd welcome others to jump in on this as well. Um, what are the similarities and differences between the MPA guide and other marine related protection strategies? That's a, I'm, I'm not quite sure I get the gist of the, the, the question. I mean, I, I think what we're trying to do here uh, with the MPA guide is use a consistent framework to look at what is being delivered and what the stages of um, implementation are. And as such, um, it, it erects a framework which is common around the world um, that has a good strong evidence base to it and could act as a, uh, or in my view, should act as a, as a common narrative to help us categorize what we're trying to achieve. I think one of the problems has actually been that we, we have simply, as I said earlier, been, had a blind spot in this area to having that, that level of detail, which Kirsten refers to, you know, stuff is all lumped into to MPAs and we need to be able to unpeel that a bit. And I think it is, it is a fairly uh, um, new uh, um, uh, element of clarity that we're bringing with the MPA guide to help do that. So it would also mean then that uh, where you are talking about other protection strategies, you can actually see with clarity on the categorization that the MPA guide is giving, what, what is meant by that. And you'll be able to peel down the layers and then relate your understanding of protection to what the MPA guide is saying. And perhaps that does get to the kind of more to the heart of, of that question. And maybe just as a follow up, I guess, more specifically, um, and to Dan or to others, uh, can you talk about how the MPA guide might be useful or you could apply it to other effective conservation measures or OECMs? Yeah, I, I, can, I can sort of answer that straight off. So we've been developing guidance uh, um, in IUCN for the CBD on over effective area based measures. 
So these are, for, for those of you not familiar with this, these are in the same sentence in target 11. So it's, marine, it's protected areas, marine protected areas, and other effective area-based measures. So they're material to the case about delivering in situ conservation of biological diversity. And you can view other effective area-based measures as having an effective biodiversity outcome, but they may have come through other routes, uh, protection of historic wrecks, um, exclusion zones, and so forth. Where do they fit? Well, by definition, they're effective. By definition, they're implemented. Um, so they are actually, in, in terms of the, 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 the sort of the diagram, if you like, of, of ranging from minimally to fully protected and committed to actively managed, they're in the top right-hand corner, if you can imagine that, of that diagram, because by definition, they already exist. They're already delivering measurable in situ biodiversity conservation outcomes. So in actual fact, when we, we get to this, and, and as various people have said, as Naomi said, today is really not the end, but the start of it. It's been a marathon to get to the start, but to get to the start, it does provide us with a framework that can also embrace other effective area-based measures in the marine environment as well. And we might need to do a little bit more work in that area uh, with some more, more guidance, et cetera, so forth, but it still fits by definition in, that, in, in, in the framework. Great, thank you for that. Um, Kirsten, I want to turn to you. Uh, how does the MPA guide address highly migratory fish species with broad geographic ranges and dynamic life histories? Oh yeah, thanks. I love that question. It is a challenge, right? When we think about borders drawing lines on a map, we think about those species that range so widely. Um, and we wouldn't expect them to stay their entire life cycle within those boundaries. So I think this is a great question. And when we look at the purpose of MPAs, which is um, by IUCN's def definition, biodiversity conservation, you know, we take into account, you know, whether, for example, some of those species um, may benefit from MPAs during particular times of their life cycle. Um, whether there are specific resources that they use or need that can be protected by MPAs. But this really underscores the need for this kind of whole ocean approach to the conversations that we're having. MPAs are one piece of the puzzle. Um, effective fisheries management is another one. And so I think the guide really points to that. It points to what um, MPAs can do. It points to what they typically do based on decades of scientific research. And it also points to a lot of the questions that we still need to answer, the research that we still need, and how when we kind of peel back the layers, as we've been saying about the different types of protection, which type of protection might be um, most applicable, for example, to highly migratory species. Great, thank you. Um, Esther, I want to turn to you for some of your insight from your deep experience looking at MPAs in Indonesia. Um, but I welcome other panelists to jump in on this as well. Um, the term MPA effectiveness is something we hear a lot. Um, but what really makes an MPA effective? And how does the MPA guide help you when you're looking at that? Um, from Indonesian perspective, I mean, I'm, um, I don't represent the whole Indonesian, but at least for me and some stakeholder that have been working on MPAs in Indonesia, uh, MPA effectiveness means that it can protect the biodiversity, but also uh, provide the livelihood for the communities. So that's MPA effectiveness. So there will be like less conflicts, social conflicts. Um, there will be equity. Um, for uh, and access for community as well. And the MPA guide, well, from what I experienced, you seeing that it's really flexible and there's no judgment basically. Uh, at the beginning, when we talked with the government about this MPA guide, they when they saw the metrics, they would say that, oh, we should go to somewhere highly protected, um, like the highest stage of establishment. And Indonesian MPAs cannot, probably could not achieve that because we have a multi-use uh, MPAs. And then um, when we walked through the guide together with the stakeholders and government, we realized that this is 
the aim is not to find to become the highest like the the best country in the world to apply this i mean to to implement mpas the most effective mpas but it's more about how communicate um the progress um to stakeholders so we are here and then next year we are moving here and then we move to the other side the other quadrant for example so it, it's it's something that we like a lot um because with the with the current available tracker tools it's only numbers or like a stepping stone so there are like five uh one tracker tool use the building blocks there are five stages and the other one use scale so between zero to 100 so people would think i have to achieve 100 but the mpa guide is different so it's it's something that i think um is important for the other countries to um you know to realize that this is kind of flexible and it's there's no judgment at all and the, the other thing that uh we also like because it's really easy to understand to be used especially for non-scientists because we have to realize that people who are working on mpas is not only the scientists but there are many other people as well thank you that's a really wonderful perspective um we are almost at time but i any other quick comments on that before I wrap us up? I just wanted to respond to something. Thank you so much, Estra, for also bringing up that point of multi-use MPAs and different zones within MPAs. So just wanted to make sure to be clear also about the fact that in multi-use MPAs, you may have different levels of protection in the same MPA. And so the MPA guide supports tracking that. You may be able to achieve um, sustainable use and provision because you've got some more fully or highly protected areas inside around with multi-use areas that might be lightly protected, for example. So, um, and just another way to bring clarity to how in multiple ways. Great, thank you. I wish we had more time, but um, unfortunately we are going to have to leave it there. I know there are several more questions. Um, so I think we will be trying to get back to you on some of those. I know the co-authors look forward to continuing the dialogue. So I encourage folks to reach out. Um, this is an amazing community that has come together this morning and uh, I think it'd be wonderful to continue that conversation. Um, for those of you who have not had a chance to read the guide or to check out the resources that have been put together, I encourage you to go to the website and there are links in the chat and I think they'll probably pop up again uh, in just a second. So please go ahead and check that out and reach out with any questions. Again, thank you to Ambassador Kutz and Mr. Van Havre for being our amazing speakers who really helped us set the stage. Thank you to this incredible panel. Um, congratulations to all of the authors on the publication of the guide. I know it's been a lot of work. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who's joined us from all over the world from all different time zones. Um, have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank you. <laughs>